If you were to ask me several years ago what I think about foldable phones and their rising popularity, I would say it's an interesting concept with great potential. Fast forward to today, I still think that's the case, but the majority of the users, including myself, still prefer the standard phone factor. For the last couple of years, brands like Samsung, Huawei and Motorola have been releasing their foldable smartphones every year with an occasional Xiaomi model, and while these devices are selling, they definitely did not live up to the expectation. And now two years after the previous one, we finally got to test the latest Motorola Razr phone, whose design is based on the iconic Razr model that everyone was raving about 15 years ago. Our editorial staff was in London back in 2019 when the first foldable Razer was unveiled and about a year later we got its 5G iteration which was supposed to bring 5G capabilities as well as improve on the features of its predecessor and now, two years later, we are testing the new Razer 2020. The first thing that caught our eye was the fact that the new Razer decided to deviate from the standard Razer concept, which certainly wasn't the easiest decision for the phone's identity, but I have to say it's definitely justified as it brings some noticeable benefits to the device. Some would say that it resembles the Samsung Flip concept, and I can partly agree with that, but looking back at 2020 models, we could say that that concept did not age well. No matter how recognizable the previous Razer phone was, that huge useless space on the chin of the phone into which the upper half of the phone folded is not something a lot of users are going to miss. That being said, having only 70% screen to body ratio in 2022 is something no one wants these days. That is why I believe that Motorola chose the only possible route for the Razer 2020 that will fit users' expectations. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the Razer 2020 is a real masculine, stylish phone, the kind that gentlemen in a suit would carry. It is its own kind of cool. Sure, ladies can use it as well, as it specially fits well with some elegant outfits like the black dress. Simplicity. Motorola opted to go for a different kind of audience than Samsung, whose flip comes in a variety of colors trying to cater to a wider audience. Now, what I believe is better about the Razer than the Flip 4 is the secondary screen, which is larger and better positioned and more usable with its 2.7 inches and 573 times 800 pixels compared to only 1.9 inch screen with a resolution of 250 times 512 on the Flip 4. The Flip 4 screen is primarily intended for secondary use, for stuff like notifications, and only if you really have to use it, since it's placed at the very bottom of the phone when closed. While Motorola's solution is located at the very center, so you can still use the screen real estate to watch a video, answer your chats, or keep Google Maps open. And if you're trying to take a selfie using a primary camera, you have a way bigger screen. We say primary camera because unlike its predecessors, the new Razer comes with two cameras on its back, which perfectly fits with its overall design. The phone build is truly excellent, really good, the phone is solid and compact, and the new hinge is fantastic, providing such a nice feel when performing the open slash close gesture. The keys are a bit small, so they do take some time getting used to, and I've ended up way too many times pressing the power button while trying to change the volume. Motorola had finally ditched the plastic from its new Razer, which is a welcome change for a device in this price range, and now comes packed with Gorilla Glass 5, both front and back, aluminum frame, aluminum 7000 to be exact, with the hinge being made of extremely high quality steel. But let's go back to the aluminum 7000 from which the phone's frame is made. It is the most resistant, the best, and the most expensive aluminum alloy, with zinc and magnesium admixtures, and it is the least susceptible to corrosion. Not really sure why Motorola opted for Gorilla Glass 5 instead of the Victus Glass, but at least they have included a plastic case for both halves of the phone. And while testing the phone outdoors, we did put on a case on the phone to avoid any potential accidents, and I have to admit that the case was barely noticeable. If you ever had a chance to see the previous generation of Razer phones, you will immediately notice that the 2022 model is clearly wider, which is even more evident when you hold it. On the other hand, you can no longer open it with only one hand, which had its magic ever since the first Razer, but still, we have to welcome these kind of changes and only thing we can guess is that Motorola did some marketing research and analysis which led to the 22 form factor. 
It is 8 millimeters wider, 5 millimeters shorter, and 0.7 millimeters thicker. Changed form factor has a plus side, as with no chin, there is now more room for the larger battery. One thing everyone hated with the first couple of generation of foldables was the space between the two halves when the phone is folded, but that is more or less a thing of the past, or it's barely noticeable on some models. On older ones you could peek through it. Foldable screen technology has obviously advanced to enable almost gapless folding, but it does bring some risk in case there's some sand or a tiny stone fragment on it that you won't notice before folding. As far as the build goes, Motorola has done an exceptional job, hands down. The only department where the Razer lags behind its one and only competition in the foldable department is the IP rating. And while the Razer is resilient to some water splashes, the Z Flip 4 can withstand water submersion of 1.5 meters. While dropping phones like these can't end well in any case, I would still prefer Gorilla Glass Victus Plus on it rather than Gorilla Glass 5. And when you do unfold the device, you'll be greeted by a huge 6.7 inch foldable P OLED display with the resolution of 1080 x 2400 pixels. A far, far better combination than the one on the Razer from two years ago, which had a half inch smaller screen. The aspect ratio is now a normal 20 to 9, compared to the very strange aspect ratio Razer 5G had. The screen also comes with 144Hz refresh rate, which can only be used while gaming and you will have to set it up in the Moto settings. Sadly, this means that the screen doesn't offer dynamic refresh rate, which means you can only choose between 60 and 120Hz or leave it on auto mode. What caught us by surprise was the fact that the screen was able to output 1185 nits of brightness, which is great. Fun fact, the Razer screen is about 200 nits brighter than the one on the Google Pixel 7 Pro. And now, the answer to the burning question we'll all been waiting for. How does the screen crease look? We all know that the first solution Samsung and Huawei made didn't blow us away, and even then, Motorola was the first one to make some advancements in reducing the size of the crease. And while I still can't say that the crease is completely gone, because it's still definitely there and you can see it and both feel it under your fingertips, it's definitely the best one so far in the industry. If you look at the edges of the screen, you will notice that they are curved in a way that the screen follows the contours of the phone housing, which is not completely flat across its width. I personally don't like the curved shape, but I guess they needed to follow certain design patterns to achieve this form factor. It's something that probably won't bother many people, who will adjust shortly, but this is just my two cents. The second display on the back proved to be quite useful with actual usable screen real estate and not some gimmick for a notification or taking selfies. With the always on feature, you can set the secondary screen to show whatever you like such as time, calendar, weather report or quick dialing. You can also use the secondary screen to watch YouTube videos when closed, listen to podcasts or even follow a mini version of Google Maps. And also you can answer messages from your preferred messaging app. Now, the majority of these features were present on the last Razer model, but they certainly look more polished on the 2022 version. Despite all of its functions, the only thing we're missing is the brightness adjustment of this screen for those sunny days. But that's maybe just us asking a lot. Internal hardware specs were the previous Razer's weak point, heavily criticized by the public. The main problem was that Motorola had a phone that targeted the premium market, charged the premium price, but came with mid-range processor. This time around, Motorola has decided to pack the latest and the greatest in its Razer, the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, which provides top-of-the-line performance for everyday use, intensive gaming with high refresh rate, and processing the information coming from the camera sensor, producing high-quality photos and videos. Paired with 8GB of RAM and 256GB of storage, the Motorola Razer has power to spare, in every sense of that word. And as for the battery drain, considering the significantly increased battery capacity compared to its predecessor from 2800 to 3500 mAh and a high energy efficient chipset, we just expected a little better battery life. After our 10 hour YouTube video playback test, Razer was left at 22%, while its main competitor, the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 4, had at least 34% after the same time frame. I believe the reason for this is the exceptional brightness of the screen and this is definitely the brightest Motorola phone when set to 
I still think that this will be more than plenty for a whole day of battery use for an average user. As far as charging options are concerned, it offers 30 watt charging versus a 25 watt that Samsung offers, plus the charger itself comes in the box. I just have to note that unlike its competition, Razer sadly doesn't support wireless charging. And before we move on to the cameras, let's just mention that like other foldables, the fingerprint sensor is located on the power button. The other thing I have to mention is the outstanding sound coming from the speakers. And this is a trend that Motorola is continuing after their Edge 30 Ultra and Fusion models that also had high quality speakers. And oh, how the tide turns. Last year, we were bashing Motorola for not even having stereo speakers. And this year, they're one of the best speakers in the industry. And now when it comes to cameras, we are somewhat used to the fact that foldable phones are not quite on the level of current flagships, despite falling into the price range. The situation is rather similar with the Razer phone, but the camera system is certainly not weak. Far from it. Now on the back side, we have two camera sensors, the main 50 megapixel and a 30 megapixel ultra wide, while the 32 megapixel front facing camera is located in a punch hole on top of the display. So only the essential are there, but simple solutions are sometimes the best ones, especially when camera information is processed by currently the best chipset in the Android world. The sensor behind the main camera is in this case the 50 megapixel Omnivision OV50A, supported by phase autofocus and optical stabilization. We were very pleased with what it was able to achieve in daylight condition during tests, even though it can't really compete in terms of performance with the best non-foldable flagship devices. The photos are very pleasing to the eye, with natural colors, good sharpness and solid dynamic range, always tastefully measured to finally represent what we wanted to capture. And if you zoom into the photos, you'll notice the sharpness is compensated a bit in post-processing, but it wasn't overdone so it doesn't bother you at all when you view the photo at its original size. The ultra-wide sensor is a 13 megapixel high 1336 signed by Hynix, which is a familiar brand name when it comes to RAM memory. As expected, the photo it takes are not at the level of the main sensor when it comes to details and sometimes they differ from it slightly in color depending on the situation. Although the quality is not on the level of the main one, this camera managed to take really good photos on a couple of occasions so it is certainly quite usable when you need a wider frame and stepping back to use the main camera is just not an option. And when it gets dark, Motorola's night vision mode takes over and we can say it does a really good job on the main sensor. An excellent level of detail and well-measured brightness and contrast make for very attractive photos that are again not exaggerated but beautifully represent what you want to shoot. It seems that Motorola has finally improved night vision in the right way and judging by the last few edge models and this phone as well, they're definitely on the right track. The ultra-wide sensor struggles at night, so even though night vision gets the most out of it and creates usable photos, the quality of the main camera is a reason enough to forget about it after 5pm, at least until spring when the day gets a bit longer. Video recording is supported in 8K with 30, 4K up to 60, and 1080p with up to 120 frames per second. The quality of 4K video on the main camera is very good with a solid level of detail that is highest when shooting at 30 FPS, while in 60 FPS shots offer slightly better stabilization which combines both optical and electronic stabilization. And even though this is not a new iPhone which is referenced for a good video, I have to say that the video quality is more than satisfactory compared to other phones. Night video for the main camera is also a very pleasant surprise, but as long as you're not moving a lot since the stabilization starts to struggle during the night and doesn't look that great in motion. Video from the ultra-wide camera at night is nowhere near the level of the main, primarily in terms of noise and detail, but it's better than we expect, although we still recommend sticking to the excellent main camera. Let's not forget the front selfie camera with the Omnivision OV32C 32 megapixel sensor, which works okay, has decent color reproduction, but we can't really say it excels in terms of detail. Interestingly, it seems to do better at night provided you have a steady hand. But since this is a Motorola Razr, you practically don't even need the front camera because instead you can use the main one, which is certainly better than any selfie sensor. The selfie camera should be used for communication via video calls and now that I think about it, that's about it since for anything else you can use your superior main camera and you don't even have to open your phone. 
Now the operating system that comes with the Motorola Razr phone is the Android 12 with dark mode set as default. And one thing that caught my eye now more than ever with the dark mode enabled is that the menus are increasingly resembling the ones on the old Windows phone devices. As a manufacturer that doesn't give up on the native look of the Android platform, Motorola doesn't change much in the user interface department, but again, Motomods offers some unique functionality that you won't get on other phones. However, Motorola continues to work on customizing its interface, which we know was their major weak point for the last few years, and with the new vivid main wallpaper, we have to praise the looks, which are way better than on the pale ones we've seen on Motorola phones for years. What is definitely special about this model is the possibility of very nice customization options of the display on the secondary screen. And I already talked about it when I described the functionality of the display on the outside of this phone. And I definitely recommend Razer phone buyers to go through the Razer Tips presentation and the Moto applications before starting to use it in order to just fully understand an even better way how to use all the Razer offers to its full potential. The overall impression of the Motorola Razr phone is that this is by far the best Razr smartphone to date. With all the technical advancements in the industry, better components and materials, and listening to the voice of the people led the device that we know today as the Razr 2022. Modern design, powerful hardware platform, excellent display brightness, fantastic almost creaseless screen solution, excellent sound coming from the stereo speakers, very usable cameras, nice functionalities even when the phone is closed are the main features of the new Razer phone. My only gripes about this phone are the lack of better screen protection like the Victus glass, lack of wireless charging capabilities and water resistance, and definitely better battery life found on the rest of its competition. And I do have to point out that the Razer is about 125 euros more expensive than its competition. I will let the viewers be the judge whether this phone is worth $1200. And yes, while there are certainly more powerful devices with better performance and better camera system, we cannot really compare foldables with their standard counterparts. Thank you for watching another Bench House review featuring the Motorola Razr 2022 model. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like and for more videos like this, subscribe to our channel. My name is Marco and I will see you next time.